The title of our talk to be given by Brian Ulrich is Over 100 Years Photographing Consumer Culture, Past, Present, and Future. Um, as many of you know, I'm still very much on my learning curve here at the Ulrich. Um, I realized today that we have lectures and we have buzzworthy art talks. <laughs> and so I asked one of my members of staff, well, now what's the difference? And they said, well, generally a lecturer is someone who is uh, well-established, very distinguished, um, more like you, Bob. And um, a buzzworthy is given by somebody who's hip and happening and with it <laughs> and provocative. So Brian, congratulations, you're a buzzworthy. And we're thrilled to have you here with us this evening. Brian Ulrich is, of course, one of the outstanding artists um, who is represented with our, within our exhibition, Stocked, Contemporary Art from the Grocery Aisles. Uh, Stocked is something we're very proud of, produced here by the Ulrich and soon to be launched on a uh, three-venue tour beyond Wichita. Stocked is uh, sponsored by Delta Dental, the Lois K. Walls Foundation of Walls IGA, I learned today, uh, Spirit Aero Systems, Louise Barron, Norma Griever, Richard D. Smith, and Sandra M. Langle, Keith and Georgia Stevens, and John and Nancy uh, Bramer. So we are uh, very appreciative of these folks for making this great exhibition possible. And of course, I think most of you know that tonight we rescheduled Brian's talk. Uh, it was to be during one of the snowstorms in February. And so then we have a second major event later this week on Thursday evening. We have a panel discussion and our own Emily Stamey will be back uh, to lead that. Um, Brian, let me put my glasses on for this, sorry. Um, Brian's images selected for stock examine the spaces in which we shop for our food. Following Pre uh, President George W. Bush's assertion in 2001 that, quote, the vitality of our economy depends upon the willingness of Americans to spend, end quote, Ulrich set out to investigate the consumption habits of our nation. Brian Ulrich earned his MFA in photography at Columbia College in Chicago and a BFA in photography from the University of Akron. He is now an assistant professor at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University um, in the photography and film department. His work is widely collected by major museums, it's quite a lengthy list, and he's had solo exhibitions at the Cleveland Museum of Art, our own Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City, and the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. His work's been extensively published, including his uh, first monograph, entitled, Is This Place Great or What?, in 2011 by Aperture. Uh, please, welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Brian Ulrich. Well, great. Thanks, for everybody, for having me. And, and, of course, the Ulrich for naming your museum after me and <laughs> all that good stuff. Um, this, is, this has been a real treat, and of course, you know, as soon as I set foot in a new place, I want to have thousands of more hours to explore and set down the camera and take time to look and talk to the students, um, et cetera. But um, yeah, I wanted to, 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 I like to switch things up a little bit with the talks so that they're, um, you know, I don't feel like I'm saying the same things all the time. And, um, one thing that uh, Amy and I were talking about earlier was kind of my trajectory as a as an artist and as a student um, and how I got into this whole thing. And I thought I would talk a little bit about that. Um, when I graduated undergrad at, from the University of Akron, I, um, like a lot of people, I didn't really, I was so kind of invested in making pictures and, and, and this was still mostly black and white and dark room process so that took you know many hours and those they were wonderful hours that I dearly miss um, and I, I spent a lot of time really invested in in the picture making process like a lot of people and then all of a sudden kind of was faced with the reality of I was going to have to go back out into the real world um, 
So I started asking questions like, what do I do about that? Um, and I remembered one of the things that got me interested in photography was a book by um, a woman named Barbara Tannenbaum on the photographer Ralph Eugene Meatyard. And it was such a weird, wonderful book. I remember picking up just being like, what is this stuff? Like weird masked people and kicking the camera over while during the exposure. Um, so I had to find out who this woman was because it said Akron Art Museum on it. So I, I, I kind of um, kept her on my radar a little bit. And then I met her one day at the school and said, you know, uh, I've been wanting to talk to you because you made this really strange book and I want to know more why you would ever do this because it's amazing and I can't imagine more than 10 people being interested in it. Um, and she said, well, you should do an internship with us. So I did an internship with the Akron Art Museum the summer I graduated and and then you know, one of those lunches, they asked me, what are you gonna do next? And I said, well, uh, I guess I'll move back to New York and work at a gallery or something. Um, and, you know, they said, all right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna call some people. So the, later that afternoon, I had three interviews scheduled for, for ga different galleries in New York City. And, and one of them was the Howard Greenberg Gallery. So I kind of packed everything up and went to New York and started working in the back room, wrapping up vintage black and white prints and for, for clients in Howard's gallery. But one thing I did do there was just start to use all the access to that material to do tons and tons of research. And I didn't really think of it as research. I was just fascinated with and curious by the amount of information I now had access to. And I would stay till 11 or 12 at night, just kind of pulling boxes off the shelf. And um, one of the books, Howard also has a great library, as you would imagine. But at one point, Howard represented Robert Adams. Um, this was around 1996. And you know, I, I don't know if it exactly worked out in the relationship with Howard trying to sell Howard, Robert's work. Um, you know, Robert was maybe a little bit too contemporary at the time. And, um, but he, so he had all these books, and one of them was this book called What We Bought the, the New World. And I remember picking up the book, and I, I decided to leave the gallery and, and leave New York and go back to Ohio and move back to Cleveland just because it was so um, intense there. And I, I really couldn't find a way to make work. And so one of the things that they did was just said like, well, if there's more than two copies of the book, you're welcome to kind of, if you can carry it, it's yours. You know, this is like way before photo book insanity that we live in. And, and, and wisely, I picked up this book. And so years later, I always, this book was very in influential about me, Adam's photographing in Colorado in the 1970s, the idea of a long-term project you know, somebody doing a project even at that time for four years was, to me, a big deal. And um, I thought a lot about this picture later on, and I always thought that Adams was really on to something, and I felt like, you know, he just, there was, there's, there was something a lot more there that I, that I almost wished he had kind of taken further, especially when it came to his portraits of shoppers and shopping um, and people in parking lots. So um, that kind of moves me into the, the first chapter of, of what became a really big project, but originally started as just a simple kind of curiosity, which was uh, the days after 9-11, I was really curious if people were patriotic shopping. Um, I, I, I kind of con couldn't understand the premise, and I couldn't understand it because my parents uh, grew up in Germany at the end of World War II. They were kids, and so I had grown up with war stories my whole life, and then a war happens in my lifetime, and we're kind of getting messages to go shopping. And I was like, wait, wait, this, this is completely conflicting with what I would think would happen. And I was curious if people were just going to do that. Were people going and kind of patriotic shopping? and? And I answered that question pretty quickly. I mean, people kind of were, and of course all the stores were red, white, and blue, everything. And 
um, they really capitalized on it. But then after spending a little bit of time there uh, looking and trying to make pictures, I realized I was onto something a lot bigger. And again, thinking of Adam's work and, and some, some others as well, I realized that this connection between our own well-being, prosperity, leisure time, um, wealth, safety, all those things were kind of tied up in this specific moment. And I realized there was something happening right now, like in 2001, 2002, that was really, really important to try to pay attention to. I don't know why I felt that way. I felt that way. Um, I'd moved to Chicago for graduate school. It was part of my graduate studies. And everybody else thought I was crazy. Nobody thought I could kind of revisit the subject that other people had done, especially with you know, people like Andrea Skursky kind of owning the, the 99 cent store photograph and, and that critique of consumerism that exists there. Um, but I kept at it and it really took me about two years to figure out how to make the pictures. Um, so this is March of, of 2003 and this was my spring break, um, probably right about this time. And it was also the week we started the war in Iraq. And I really wanted to make pictures for that entire week to, to photograph what was happening here in the United States and in the Midwest in to make the connection to or correlation to or just even the, uh, the idea that it's under the guise of what was happening there. You know, at that time we were really just seeing the kind of really um, uh, the green screen night vision goggle version of the bombing thing happening on 24 hour news. And <clears throat> so I kind of thought of them as, as, as or, or kind of jokingly thought of myself as a war photographer in a sense. Um, and, and again, it seemed to be that this kind of giant grand target with its 40 something lanes of checkout would, would really epitomize that idea. Um, so these are all uh, working with like a medium format camera, a waist level viewfinder, and they're, they're candid. There's no, I tried initially getting permission. They were not gonna have it. Um, and I realized that it was really too important to try. And again, being a bit stubborn helped. So I just figured, devised a way in a system of doing that, um, which was in many cases just walking the store for a while and figuring out the right setting for a picture and then, <clears throat> excuse me, waiting for it to happen. Um, and it was interesting, right? There's this, this kind of non-architecture architecture. It's a box. You know, it's this really kind of ugly place that's meant to be important and meant to have all this um, influence on us. And I also thought it was really interesting that you could make a picture in this place that just by photographing it allowed you to be critical of it because it's not a space we're really ever critical of because we're there for a purpose and that purpose is very specific and it's often kind of fueled by either emotions or tasks or kind of a primal ideas of hunting um, even, which happens, comes up a lot more later, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, I made this picture um, maybe a week later on the travels and, you know, I, I again realized that there was this great connection to this thing happening now in 2003 at that moment and the kind of art that was made at the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century where many French artists were making work that was about that transition of culture that was happening. Like there were all these big changes happening at that time. Um, so I made this picture and I immediately thought of this picture, right? The kind of Cowie Bot responding to this parking lot he used to play in as a boy which is now the kind of new modernized Paris, which is all about a commerce-based Paris, right? And it, it, it seemed again, all of a sudden I realized, well, I have to make this whole project indoors always, you know? The ceilings are never meant to be looked at and they go forever, but if you just look up, they're totally amazing. 
And of course, from a photographer standpoint, it was this thing where you can use all the design and the line and form of that ceiling to kind of move your eye through. And of course, here in this Costco, it becomes a kind of starlight scene. You know, I started thinking about photographing families and thinking about different groups of people um, from afar, but it also dawned on me that it was important to try to make portraits in a very kind of specific and traditional photographic portrait sense. And what I mean by that is that the portraits were meant to function so that you may possibly know that person, right? In the beginning, it was kind of easy to make a picture that would almost make fun of somebody or be a kind of joke. Um, but it was a lot harder to try to make a picture of this woman on this phone at that moment and make it so descriptive and so believable that you feel as if you're standing in front of her too. Because I realized that if that works, if we can do that, or if the pictures can do that, then we can also bounce our own um, personality and our own psyche off of that person, which is kind of how portraiture often works, right? We kind of reflect our own ego off. And then you're there too, you're in the picture. You can't not think about all of us kind of entranced into this system, right? I liked that. I liked that idea and that became really important in the work. Um, people would come back to me after seeing the pictures and say, you know, I can't not think of your pictures now that I go back to the store. And so all of a sudden the experience of, of going shopping was transformed into again, something critical and even conceptual. I also started thinking about going again and making like just really compartmentalizing the production to like kids or elderly people or middle-aged or how people are market, marketed to in the space. Um, before the age, kids bef up until the ages of eight are the most marketed to group. Um, the most marketing money is spent on between birth and eight years old. And that's where the, the ma majority of the marketing money goes and it's because they want you to identify with, your, with a specific brand for life. And of course the least amount of, of advertising dollars goes towards the elderly because they're lifespan as a consumer is, is so limited. <laughs> um, and the, yeah, I like to tell, I like to tell students that there's just countless amounts of photographs and things out in the world waiting for you to, to just take a picture of. And if you spend enough time really looking and really working, you will find these things. They will appear to you like mirages of gifts from the photo gods. And if I could channel Walker Evans into the 21st century, here I would. Um, in this portrait of a portrait of the family holding the projector, it's a real family, the young boy, you know, kind of growing into his oversized suit here. And, and, and the wonderful riddle of this projector in which we will never know. And I love that, I love that we will continue to invest ourselves into the picture to try to figure out what is going on. And again, thinking about this in relationship to um, the penny picture display that Evans made in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and then of course also thinking about the architecture of the space itself. Um, you know, they, <laughs> I remember a couple of times you know, they would, sometimes people would come up and say, people worked at the store and say like, excuse me, sir, you can't take pictures here. And I'd usually just kind of laugh and say like, oh yeah, no problem. I just didn't want to leave the camera in the car or, but once in a while I would ask, you'd be like, well, why? <laughs> <laughs> and they would, some of the reasoning was very interesting. One of the big reasoning is that, um, we don't want competitors to borrow or steal our um, display designs. <laughs> and I kind of, you know, I didn't want to go there, but I couldn't help myself in saying that. Uh, I've been to a lot of stores and your designs look like the rest. There's shelves and there's things on them. 
There's things at the ends of the shelves. They call those end caps. I don't know what there is to steal. <laughs> There's really not, it's not very sophisticated, this machine here. Um, and here it is, even it's kind of most simplistic, like the wood panel wall and the fake wood floor with the only kind of organic thing in the picture is the milk, which is sadly left on the floor. Um, yeah, you, you know, again, lots and lots of working, trying to get there before the mops come to clean up the mess. I started getting a little uh, cocky about this. Like people really wouldn't notice or didn't seem to pay attention. So I thought like, well, how far can I go with this? So I started bringing a four by five camera to photograph these things. And it, it wasn't just about that like rebellious little voice in the back of my head, which always exists. It was also about the fact that I really wanted to describe this thing so well and I really wanted a kind of optical fidelity that helped you to think about this thing very differently than if you were just there, right? I mean, the problem of this project is like some people just see target, right? And that's it. And it's a, and it's a kind of real interesting problem, which is to try to get them to think about it in a deeper way. Um, so uh, things that cost 9.99 on the left, Cash and Redemption in Las Vegas on the right. Um, other things that cost $9.99, like the crucifix or the um, appropriately themed for this time of year Easter basket with military combat kit in the <laughs> Easter basket. $9.99, you start to figure these things out that it's a very specific price point for kind of useless stuff. You know, like it, if things are, be very suspicious if things are priced $9.99. Think twice, I warn you. Um, my next book will be priced $9.99. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then, you know, I'd been working on this project from roughly 2001 till 2006 and Driving back from a lecture in Minneapolis, I stopped to get gas and yeah, you find this. And it was a eureka moment as well where the, the, the difficulty again was trying to insinuate that there's this shift in political ideology that had shaped you know, many of the, the, the pictures of the behavior, right? The environment had dramatically changed around people after 9-11, and it's a hard thing to photograph. It's not necessarily tangible, other than like newspaper headlines or, you know, but the, the terror threat level thing was a kind of wonderful visualization of that idea. Um, and there it was, the one picture in all this where you're actually about to go outside and you're supposed to be so scared about what's out there that you should turn around and talk to the cashier and find out exactly what the details are because they have the phone that goes directly to the Secretary of Defense, I guess. I, I, I never quite figured out why the cashier would know more than me. Um, yeah. Wonderful things and discoveries in the back rooms and you know, you work on a project for a while and it just continues to open into whole other fields of discovery or thinking about the people who work in these places, and that comes up later in Thrift in the next project. So Thrift kind of began in 2005, and um, Thrift came out of a few things as well. I, 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 again, I didn't really think this was gonna be a big, huge project, I, but I'd already been, had kind of five years in, and, or at this point, four. And I started to you know, feel like I had done a lot of the, what I wanted to do in the retail kind of chapter. And it was also the fact that I was making pictures in these places and they really were all the same. I was traveling around the country going to Walmarts and they're all the same. And it was like, why am I doing this? This is really dumb. <laughs> and I just wanted to do it because <clears throat> to potentially see what the differences were, which there wasn't many. Um, 
but also to kind of reinforce the homo homogenization of the culture. So the titles for all those retail pictures are place. So that Las Vegas and Chicago would really be interchangeable. And I loved that. Um, but thrift, you know, I, I just was so ecstatic about the idea of seeing things that were completely random and displays of goods that had no purpose or meaning whatsoever, but kind of in their visual juxtaposition had a new meaning. Um, these pictures were also done, this is, I moved exclusively over to the four by five more or less and and really started to take my time because the stores were happy to let me photograph. I would call them up, I would do research by zip codes, would find places and say, you know, I'm doing a project about thrift stores and their relationship to consumer goods. And they'd say like, oh, come on Tuesday because the pile is back out the door into the parking lot of donated goods. And, and they totally understood why I would want to photograph this thing. Um, and this was also for me, after photographing big box stores and kind of middle class shopping experience, a way to look at a lower income class and think about thrift as a kind of allegory for issues of poverty in this country um, and how that relationship of consumer goods is completely related to that idea. Um, I love these salt and pepper shaker teardrops that are smiley faces. And the used Vicks Vapo rub with the dead baby photograph and Joe Cocker dripping price tag. I mean, you can't, I could not make this stuff up. And I dare any contemporary artist to come up with this, a combination of things this ridiculous and wonderful. Um, but there it was in, in the kind of thrift store in Indianapolis, you know, or these kinds of things where the back of the van of the donation vehicle, they had kind of tied up and captured Brittany and were covering her up two or three times a day and uncovering her. Um, these spaces were so kind of simple and utilitarian and again, a total lack of design, like the stereo kind of shoved up into this temporary made kind of wall that's just there to hang this ugly fluorescent light. An unknowingly tribute to Dan Flavin over that, you know, uh, saturates the color of all these clothes and or this wonderful pile of packing material, which is the kind of dot matrix printer sides, like the sides of that paper that comes off of those printers, they all go there. Um, and then thinking about the portraits in Thrift, I really started to think about them differently. I'd been making them in a similar style as I had the, co the retail pictures, and they were candid and um, of the moment, people didn't know. And while I really love them, and they kind of had a, a, a way more dramatic quality to them and a lot, they were much more physical. I kind of was very suspicious of photographing this consumer class of people or photographing people who are here for different reasons. Um, they, you know, people who need this stuff or simply might be poor and photographing him in that style because it seemed to almost become comedic and I didn't really want that. I didn't want you to look at the other. I wanted it to be again about a relationship between ourselves and the people in the pictures. So again, I had permission and I was spending a lot of time in the back rooms and all over the stores and I started thinking about um, the people who worked there. I had worked in a thrift store when I was an undergrad. It was kind of a horrible experience, two, two week job. Um, putting clothes on hangers, ripping open bags for uh, 40 hours a week and just putting clothes on hangers and every third bag kind of was covered in cat pee and yeah, it's just, you know, you just go right up there. Um, and so, you know, you think about the plight of these people who are in some cases volunteers or criminals who are working off community service or 
people who are trying to get rehabilitation for drug or alcohol problems, and they're all kind of end up in this place that's about the cast offs from the other classes and trying to sort it and trying to make sense of it. Um, I kept coming up with the idea that um, the production of objects outweighs the ability to consider them because it was so big and it was so um, overwhelming that really no one could ever figure it out. They could never really give any of these objects their like real consideration of what they could be, what their value was, and what their purpose could be as they get recontextualized into a different user. So I, the, the people there all of a sudden become very heroic. I started to think about Hans Holbein and Dutch portraiture and wanting to make them serious and slow their sometimes one second exposures where people have to hold very still in a very 19th century process of picture and that hopefully gets somewhere else, right? I like that idea of suggesting that this is happening all the time and there's a kind of timelessness. Um, Jessica here, which was the cover we used on the cover of the book, was just kind of this activist girl who was in the basement of the store, of a thrift store where there were holes in the ceiling with shoots that would shoot out clothes at random and she's kind of listening to punk rock music and dancing around all this stuff and knowing strategically where to walk, which I wasn't so good at apparently. Um, and she just owned this space in a very strange way and, and, and hence the picture where she kind of owns this trash compacting version of the, of the scene in Star Wars. Yeah, and then you find other things. Um, this is the one thing that I regret not taking home. Because I would have shipped it right to Robert Gober's studio. It was just completely amazing. I have no idea what the use of that thing would ever have been, but golf shoes and plastic bags, yeah. The thrift stores are in trouble, you know, too, like with the manufacturer of new consumer goods being so cheap and so prevalent, like why need, why would you need to buy used things? So they start to, um, they're starting to fold. They can't keep up. Um, they also start to fold because they can't keep up with the donations. The donations are too too much. In Indiana, I, I, a couple of years ago, I found an entire warehouse just in the middle of nowhere, just full of donated clothes. They just couldn't deal with it, so they literally pulled up a giant, like two truckloads, and dumped all these like piles and piles of clothes in the middle of this warehouse near Gary, Indiana. You know, they can't. It's it's literally too much. Um, and then there's some uh, thrift stores which are large corporations, which are for profit, like Goodwill, and they are squeezing the smaller stores and the community service-based institutions out. Um, they're taking them over, or buying their spaces, or moving right next to them, and it, it makes it hard for them to survive. Um, I did thrift in, from 2005 until 2008, and I like really could not do it any longer. It was um, so hard to photograph this subject at a certain point because it was, I became too entrenched in it all. It was so kind of emotional. And I didn't know what quite to do. And I remembered some pictures I made in 2005. And I remember writing this idea that this kind of economic model was really unsustainable because it was based on always growth and it was not that just doesn't seem to make any sense. And in 2005, all of a sudden, things were happening and I kind of was right. Um, I had this moment of, of, of making a few pictures. I started using a big eight by 10 view camera because these pictures seemed to be so much about architecture and it was this kind of eureka moment of like, I was right all along, like this isn't going to work this way and there has to be there, this, this growth has to recede. So I was able to find a lot of these places all of a sudden and research became a lot easier and I would build maps all over. Um, this is Chicago, yeah, Chicago land, which I've done the most research, but 
Yeah, this is. I think this is a few years old, so a lot of these dots have probably changed or transformed or they've moved. Um, but I would start to go to all these places, and it wasn't hard because as soon as you found one, there was a long suburban strip of many, many others. And I loved the idea of the fact that these places, which, again, were, were had so much influence and kind of... Um, hold over our, our lives and so much impact, we're now kind of just empty and weakened. And really the only thing that changed, or the biggest thing that changed, is they took the sign off the building. And now you have no idea what it is. And without the sign, it becomes just this kind of ridiculous little vessel which, in which the only thing designed is the doorway. Because it's a box. There's nothing else you can really do with that space. Um, and then I started, you know, getting into places. This is a Marshall Fields um, on the south side of Chicago, which has now been um, bulldozed, as well as malls, the Rolling Anchors malls. And I would revisit these places. I still do if I can. I mean, I went back to this place a year ago, and there's no doors left. You can just, like, walk right in. Kids are starting to make art projects. All the, the plumbing's been ripped out, all the copper. Um, this is when it was still had two stores open. The Columbus City Center, Columbus, Ohio, also now gone. I also wanted there to be portraits in there, but it was hard. There was really no one around, except for some people, um, mall walkers being one of them. And I noticed these mall walkers and started thinking about like, how do I make a picture of a mall walker with an eight by 10 camera? It's really slow. And, and I watched this guy one day and he's walking into every architectural crevice and detail of the building. And I, I pulled him inside and was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And he said, I'm trying to maximize the amount of space that I walk in the mall. So I kind of said, like, all right, hold still. And he perfectly lined up with the stripes of his shirt and the stripes of the door of the Dillards. And, um, and also the idea that, like, now the, the kind of punk rock kids show up because there's a newfound lawlessness. There's no security left. There's no stores. You can kind of do anything in the place. And it becomes re-owned. Um, all those kind of silly rules are gone because... There's no reason to have them. Um, 1950s linoleum style store with its kind of bounding optimism disappearing into the dark. On the left is a Saks Fifth Avenue in Worcester, Massachusetts. And on the right is a Pep Boys building in Columbus, Ohio. Um, again, the, the entrance is really the only thing The Circuit Cities, of course, also the same idea. This was one of the first pictures in the project I did in 2008. Um, I made that picture, loved the idea that these Circuit Cities were originally designed to be plugs, that they would have commercials where an animated plug would fly in the air and plug into the earth and lightning would come out. And, and, and that was that's what they were, a plug attached to a box. And I loved the fact that when all the circuit cities closed, you couldn't hide them. You couldn't really transform them into anything else. So uh, one day a friend called me and said, you know, I found a yellow one, which was originally red but painted and, and kind of updated. And then this one was one day, the same friend called me and said, no, 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 you, you gotta come back, it's white now. So they turned it into this, which was going to be a new store. There's a now hiring sign here that says Future Comp USA, and Comp USA was another re computer retailer that died, but I guess was coming back. And this was another one that had appropriate been, appropriately been turned into a thrift store and um, yeah, the same thing with the blacked out signs is if we're not gonna know like, don't look, everything's okay, just keep driving, nothing going on here. Um, all this money invested in those spaces to open them, and then when, the, when it's time for them to kind of end, they're kind of just, there's very little money spent on the closing of those places, of course. 
the Six Flags Mall in Dallas, Texas, former Foley's. Um, this was a Lazarus store, department store, that uh, Stephen Shore photographed around its opening in 1973 in his book on common places. And I found pictures of it on Flickr and kind of flipped out and realized it was closed and empty. And I drove six hours in a snowstorm directly there and got there at 11 at night to make the picture in a snowstorm trying to like figure out exactly where he stood and what lens he used and all that great stuff. And came home, got the film back, sent Stephen a JPEG of this, and he just replied, thanks. <laughs> um, and so that also started me thinking about this idea of, again, time elapsing on the same space. This is the Dixie Square Mall, one of the most famous dead malls in Harvey, Illinois. Um, it's famous because they filmed the movie The Blues Brothers in that mall in 1978 the famous car chase scene through the mall. It had already been closed. They showed up, they filmed the movie, built a set and wrecked it even more and then left. And it sat for 40 something years as the kind of plague of, of social problems and blight and some, some crimes and even um, some murders. Um, so this was in 2008 in the summer and I happened to be there on Easter morning of 2009 and thought it would be interesting to make the same picture. So then I had to complete the series with fall of, of 2010 and then finally winter of 2011. With that, that's where the, the snow worked in my favor. Um, Cincinnati, Ohio. the Bell's Factory Outlet Mall in Allen, Texas, which was on fire when we got there. And my friend and I were so annoyed that it was on fire, we'd used the green sludge water to put out the fire so we could spend the rest of the day photographing and salvaging the signage. Uh, this is the inside of the Dixie Square Mall, former J.C. Penney escalator. And that, that big camera really does that thing that you hope it will do is it, it reveals a kind of optical fidelity that is absolute and profound and changes things. You know, again, you would find squatters and, and homeless kids and train hopping culture, like all of a sudden hanging out behind the mall, taking a nap. Or Dan, who had... Uh, moved into this electrical conduit box on the top of a parking deck of the mall, um, the Hollywood Fashion Center, north of Miami. Or photographers, you come across other photographers and it was like, yeah, it totally makes sense why you're here. <laughs> um, everybody's showing up to kind of revel in our own downfall, right? To kind of document it in earnest and, and me too. Um, so they became subject. And sometimes I would take, you know, meet up with people. There would be kind of meetups, like let's go and I know where there's an open door thing. Um, that, this is an installation view of some of that work installed in the Cleveland Museum of Art from uh, the fall of 2011. And, and later, um, a, about a year ago, this time last year, I had an, a solo show at the Julie Saul Gallery where I started it, you know, I'd been experimenting with integrating objects in with the, um, the photographs and here a fast food sign that came from that Bell's factory outlet mall in which I, re I had a, a neon artist basically make all new neon and tried to kind of put it back together as best as it could. Um, I'm gonna quickly show you a couple of new things which spending all those times in those malls, I started me collecting things, I would find things. And, and in one in particular, I found a mall office that was really kind of ravaged, but there were just countless amounts of files and promotional things and letters from management and social security numbers of employees and fingerprints and photographs. And of course I had to kind of start to collect these things. I also, out of my own curiosity, started um, finding on eBay, these great four by five negatives, and they all seem to be from the archives of Chicago or Detroit area newspapers. 
and I found out that there was a collector who was interested in baseball photographs who had bought like the archives from those papers and was selling them all off, selling off the stuff he didn't like. You know, he had wanted, you know, maybe uh, a couple of quintessential pictures and just was like, I'll just buy the whole thing. And so he had this weird, has this weird eBay business of selling all these things. And of course they're horribly, uh, you know, tagged in their description. So I had to spend a lot of time going through these things to find ones that were specifically related to consumerism. And initially it was like, oh, this is amazing. Here it is. Like, it kind of was a fun little compliment to my project. But as I started to collect more, this is 1948, um, the opening of a gold blots in Chicago. In 1943, a Office of Price Administration grocery store, when they were still rationing and doing um, setting prices for consumer goods so that people couldn't take advantage of the war rationing. I started to realize that these pictures were about something bigger. And if I, as I was collecting them and putting them together and sequencing things and carefully editing things out or in, um, they seemed to be about this very specific economic period that happened post-World War II, which some economists refer to as the Great Prosperity. And that in effect, this time period is, they refer to it as being the most middle class growth ever in our society in which the middle class um, boomed and they could um, have a house, a car, two kids, send those kids to college, save for retirement, all without debt. Um, and that period is supposedly from post-World War II up into the 1970s. And here it was in these journalist pictures where they're photographing the riot sale, which is far uh, the far the precursor in some cases sometimes looked worse than what Black Friday is, or the bounding optimism of the opening of a Hillman's grocery store, or again the fountain um, seen at the Ford City Mall on the south side of Chicago, or the State Street south side of Chicago. And the thrift stores were there too. And these things started to become wonderful compliments to my own pictures. I started to have weird dreams about channeling these photographers who all were basically using a very simple and unique and specific camera language, which was a four by five handheld crown graphic or speed graphic press camera with flash bulbs. And those flash bulbs could kind of reach forever. And you know, they would have to work very quickly. And they're trying to make these very quick and of the moment pictures, but with this kind of slow process. And the crime stuff starts to come in. So what these pictures start to also reveal is the entirety of the manufacture of desire. How to intrinsically create a consumer culture happens post-World War II especially. And then, of course, as the result of that, we make this thing so important to our entire culture and our whole way of being and identity as a country that, of course, people would revolve to, um, to kind of breaking the law to have the thing, right? And here, seemingly, quite an organized activity. The, discovering the Admiral phonograph underneath the hay bales or, I loved that the photographers would recreate events and there was no discussion of like photojournalism truth here. You know, he didn't show up when he was like shooting at the robber who had broken into the Safeway. He's like, okay, go over there. You were out in the field, you know, do what you were doing a half an hour ago or an hour ago. There's some that I have where there's like people tied up in the back room of stores but they're laughing because they're recreating being tied up by the robber. And yeah, and it was just, and, and that was printed and there was, and even in a, in a time period where photographic truth was even less questioned, right? Now, of course, if you were to do that, there would be extreme comments on the Flickr blog forum thing. <laughs> Um, as well as the, you know, so you also even then started to see the blight and the failure 
to um, a Shogol's restaurant boarded up is the caption for this one. Um, these things started to also coalesce into an exhibition in which we just closed in Richmond, Virginia. The show that I had at the Cleveland Museum of Art was the Copia Project almost in its entirety, retail, thrift, and dark stores. Um, that show's traveling, and it, it traveled to Richmond, Virginia, but we had kind of a bigger venue, so we decided we would kind of fill an entire floor with new work. So there's two floors of the exhibition. And in addition to those, those photographs, which I scanned and printed and made prints of, um, I started to also kind of include more of the signs and objects and found material. So here you have a toys and gift sign. Excuse me, over on the right is a architect's rendering of the Rolling Acres Mall, which happens to be the exact same vantage point as my photograph. Um, I actually found it later, was tickled to see that it was the same vantage points. Two cases of objects. These are, in one mall I found an entire, um, like several binders of all the people who had been banned from the mall. So there's portraits of thieves and robbers and drug users and people in fights and they're amazing and tragic pictures. I have hundreds of them and I edited them down to 96 for this case. Um, so on one side we had the kind of robbers and so we made the other case about the cops. So you have the kind of security guards and mall security and this kind of ridiculous notion of trying to police this environment in which we've created, which we created the desire so important. Now we're starting to take away the money and means to get all that stuff. So we're going to invest all that money in security people to police the thing, which, yeah. A detail of the Polaroids. Um, they have people's names and f addresses and f um, social security numbers and birth dates. And so we had to cover those things up. And we're originally looking into publishing these, and we can't, um, at least not in the state of Virginia. Um, a, a, an overview of the, 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 the other case, cops. Polaroids that are not thieves but celebrate the 20 inch tube television. Um, over here is a display of Montgomery Ward door poles, uh, architect um, drawing of um, a rendering of plans for parking lot spaces. Um, here's more of, I, I just love these guys. They're just, I would love to be a fly on the wall for this photo session. Just, okay, look really scary. Down, chin down, more intimidating. Completely amazing. And you know, they would like kind of post this stuff around the mall. It's like, look out, we're coming to get you. Bad guys. So this work for me started to talk about, because it moves into the 1970s, 80s, and even 90s, they start to talk about the following economic period, which people refer to as the Great Regression. Economists talk about that what happened in the 1970s was all the federal funded programs that were set in place to support middle class growths were slowly kind of eroded and chipped away. And, and you start to see that, like money started to disappear and debt economy started to become prevalent and invented, of course, into where we are now. Um, the Crime Solvers Board, the um, always prevalent group of, of enlightened minds which will figure it all out. So I, yeah, so I like those, those ideas. And I'll, again, really, really quickly talk about some new things. So, that, that the kind of great prosperity and the great regression work kind of talks about the idea of what if I could make a prequel to the Copia project or photograph the past without actually building the time machine, although I'd love to. Um, but I've also been thinking about what comes next or what's now, and I'm trying to work that out. These are some very new pictures, and they're really likely not what they're going to end up as, but I'm enjoying kind of taking my time trying to figure out how to the, make these pictures because I have a kind of idea in my head and 
but it's quite um, impractical and difficult. So these are three photographs from Barbara Crane, um, great and amazing artist from Chicago, studied with uh, Callahan and Siskind at the ID school. And she did this project in 1971 called People of the North Portal, and they're people coming out of the Museum of Science and Industry made with a four by five camera candidly, sets her focus and weights and amaze. There's many of these pictures, they're fantastic. And I started thinking about this idea of people exiting the store, like what happens when people move out into that space? What is that about? You know, you're in this really kind of totalitarian space, which everything about the inside of the store is trying to make you do one thing. And then you come outside and there's just this psychological shift for me. Not only the psychological shift, but just a light shift from a kind of dark fluorescent light, which our eyes adjust to quickly, to like the bright outside. I started to think about, is it possible to make pictures about that? It's a very kind of subtle thing, but maybe there's something in there. So initially, again, I started using the 8x10, but the limitations of the 8x10 are, are pretty, are pretty um, specific in which the lenses only go to such a, to the 125th of a shutter speed in most cases. So I had to start moving to a 4x5 because it was just quicker. Um, and I, I went to on a trip to LA because it seemed like the perfect place to have tons of light <laughs> and have a very specific light that is very LA. But also I like the idea of the difference between an economic class that shops here and shops here. So if, in theory, like if the middle class disappears, we're kind of left with Dollar Tree or Tiffany's. Um, Rodeo Drive, and the Chick-fil-A Customer Appreciation Day in Chicago, when this was last summer when there was a big kind of heated discussion about the politics of, of the um, CEO of Chick-fil-A, and I love these two guys who kind of defiantly walk arm in arm past the big crowd of customers. Dolce and Gabbana in, in, on Rodeo Drive. You know, I, I started thinking like, is it possible to break all the rules, like to make a portraiture that's a, a portrait that's about architecture, that's of the moment with the person looking at the camera, it could kind of be quick. There's random things happen that aren't necessarily kind of resolved, I like that. There's a looseness about the picture, things at the edges get lost. Um, and that's thinking about the influence of all those archival pictures and negatives that I found and really trying to understand that language and knowing that it's a language that is kind of succinctly missing from most of what photography is today. This is a marketplace in Richmond, Virginia. The Fresh Market in Destin, Florida. And the um, Walmart Market in Fort Walton Beach. So, you know, this isn't really there yet for me. It's like there's still some ways to kind of figure out what this project is, or, or maybe it's not. Maybe this just doesn't work. But I, you know, that's been going on all along. There's a lot you're obviously not seeing. And, um, I, I like that way of just being out in the world, making pictures, thinking about it, trying some things. If it fails, it doesn't matter because it's a process that is um, really quite amazing and quite a luxury to be able to do. Um, and you learn a lot from just being out in the world and something will happen. I mean, that's kind of what's gotten me all along throughout you know, the 10 years of the Copia thing. and. Certainly that if I just continue, it will as well. So it's, it's looking and thinking and driving and, and trying. You know, I love this, like the way that this picture gets activated by this guy. And this, so there's this line of people, one, two, and three. And then there's this line of people going in the other direction. You know, simple things that I, might just be about form. I'm, 
Yeah. So that's kind of it. That's where I'm at.